Hello, and welcome to EDH Rex Precon Recon, where we take a look at the data behind pre constructed commander decks to see what cards players are most commonly keeping in their precons, what cards are they cutting, what cards are they adding, and what cards haven't yet shown up in the data but have some really awesome synergies with these commanders. Right now, we're taking a look at the Planar Portal pre constructed deck from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, featuring Prosper Tomebound, the Rakdos Play from Exile commander who also makes us a ton of treasures. This is so far the most popular commander from the entire suite of Adventures in the Forgotten Realms products, and it's pretty clear to see why. There's card advantage, there's mana acceleration in the form of treasures, and a whole lot of really fun stuff that we can play around with. So let's see what players are doing with this deck. Let's first get acquainted with some of the core cards from the precon that players are definitely keeping in the deck because they have such good synergy with the commander. The name of the game here is Exile. Small effects like Light Up the Stage or Ignite the Future help us accrue card advantage and our commander rewards us for it while we do so. But there are also tons of big Exile effects that we love to see here too, such as Commune with Lava or Itali Primal Storm. All of these cards are staying within about 70 to 80% of the precons because they just have such good synergy, and Itali, in addition to playing stuff for free will gain us mana with Prosper's ability, that is just terrific. In addition to this, there are some really clever ways to play cards from Exile that players are keeping from the precon as well. For example, over half of players are keeping in cards like Gaunty Lord of Luxury to pilfer from our opponents, and Fevered Suspicion, a very expensive spell, but one that allows us to get a whole lot of treasure from Prosper, a whole lot of free spells, and which rebounds next turn to also cast itself from Exile once again. One of my favorite cards that folks are keeping in this deck, though, is Marionette Master, which is an awesome way to weaponize the treasures that Prosper makes for us. This deck can't win just by valuing people to death. We actually have to find a way to close things out, and Marionette Master is one of the best ways to do so, causing our opponents to lose tons of life just when we're accruing a whole bunch of mana. So those are some of the core cards from the precon that players love to keep around because they give us such a great roadmap for how this commander strategy will play out. By playing stuff from Exile and accruing a whole bunch of extra advantages from that, we can load up a ton of mana to use later on for some huge spells, or we can just turn those tokens into weapons against our enemies in really clever ways. So with that understanding, now let's talk about the cards that players are cutting from the deck. What cards are getting chopped as players tune up their Prosper decks even more? A lot of the cuts we're seeing can be grouped into different categories. First up, we see that there are quite a lot of token makers that players are removing from the precon. Cards like Chittering Witch, Piper of the Swarm, and Ogre Slumlord are being cut from over 80% of the decks. These are really interesting token makers, but they do seem a little bit out of place because there isn't a ton of extra token synergy for creatures that's going on in the rest of the deck, which might cause us to lose a little bit of focus. This is also the case for Loyal Apprentice and Death Tyrant, which over 50% of players are cutting as well. However, this deck is going to win the game. Creature tokens don't seem to be a part of that formula. Importantly, not all Exile cards are created equal in this deck either. For example, 81% of players are cutting the card Thysis out of the deck, even though it does cast itself from Exile with Suspend. But the wait is a little bit too long, and the effect isn't quite good enough compared to other cards we could be using. And in addition, Bag of Devouring, Is It Chemister, and Dark Dweller Oracle are getting cut from over half of these decks too. They do allow us to play from Exile, but a lot of them are just so conditional that it doesn't necessarily seem worth it to jump through all of those hoops. It turns out that the tokens weren't the only cards that players didn't like as closers in the deck. Fiend Lash, Warlock Class, and Pontiff of Blight are all getting cut from 78, 62, and 54% of decks, respectively. These cards will help us do extra damage and life loss to help us close out the game, but overall, they might be a little bit too slow, so Prosper is looking to upgrade the win conditions in a different way. The next most interesting group of cuts from the deck are some mana rocks. There are a handful of mana rocks in this deck that players are not satisfied with. Arazka Relic, for instance, is getting cut from over two thirds of decks, and Unstable Obelisk, Bucknard's Everful Purse, and Ebony Fly are also seeing a similar fate. As mana rocks go, they're just a little bit underwhelming, and we've got plenty of other, better, more reliable options that we could be using instead. Cutting these cards is definitely a good move, because some of them are less than reliable, but do keep in mind that cutting out a bunch of mana acceleration effects like this definitely means that we need to have good replacements for all of them later. We need to make sure that we've still got ramp in the deck to keep up on that mana acceleration package. On the subject of unreliability, Das Macabre is also not keeping up very popularly in Prosper decks, even though it came in the precon. It only shows up in 14% of the Prosper decks according to EDH Rex so far, and it's pretty easy to see why. This just isn't an effect that Prosper can manipulate in any specific way, and it would probably be more at home in either a reanimator strategy or a deck that cares specifically about rolling dice. 
Finally, there are some removal spells that players are removing from the deck. Namely, Hex is getting cut from about two-thirds of decks, and also Shiny Impetus is getting cut from about 49%. Hex can just be upgraded to a better board wipe later on, and Shiny Impetus, which is nice to give us treasure, is just a little bit out of place because we're more likely to just want to remove any creature outright, rather than having it pointed in a different direction. This I think is also the reason why Karazikar the Eye Tyrant is getting cut from 43% of the precon decks too. This is a cool effect, and the life loss is really quite nice, but this deck isn't necessarily set up to care about combat manipulations. However, with this all said, there is a card that so far only 22% of players are using in Prosper, and that's the card Disrupt Decorum, which I'm kinda surprised to see that players are cutting out of the precon, to be honest. This is a very powerful effect that helps keep a lot of players off of our backs, which is really, really handy when we're trying to take our time to set up a cool engine like Prosper wants us to. This card used to be extremely expensive until it's printing in this very precon product, so I would personally recommend keeping this one on the deck to give it another shot and let it prove its worth. All right, so those were cards that players were cutting out of the deck to make room for upgrades. So now let's talk about those. What are the cards that players are most commonly adding to the precon to spruce it up even more? Right off the bat, we can see that players are extremely savvy and have found some really cool ways to keep playing more cards from Exile. For example, the classic Red Staple Outpost Siege is showing up in 49% of Prosper decks, and Stolen Strategy is there to help us play even more cards off the top of libraries, but in this case, from our opponents. Valakut Exploration is another standout, showing up in 55% of the decks built so far, which is another great way to fuel an Exile engine, but also doubles as a damage output if we happen to need it. We see that 64% of players have also added in Lelia the Blade Reforged from the Strixhaven pre-constructed decks, which not only lets us play more cards from the top of our library through Exile, but also will grow really huge just as we're exiling things in general. And this value train is not anywhere close to being done. 45% of players are interested in Chandra Torch of Defiance to continue finding more cards off the top of our library. Then two thirds of players are adding in Birgi, or more specifically Horn of Harnfell, her backside, which will allow us to get a ton of cards into exile at will. And speaking of will, Jessica's will shows up in 80% of Prosper decks so far. This card's amazing just in general, but the extra synergies that Prosper accrues from it cannot be understated. And those were just red cards. There are also tons of amazing black exile cards that players are adding into this deck. For example, 71% of players are including Dream Devourer into the deck, which lets us foretell cards from our hand so that we can play whatever we want from exile without having to rely upon any randomness. Praetor's Grasp is another standout, a card that lets us dig through an opponent's deck to find a card that we want to play from them. This is a really cool way to get access to effects that red and black normally couldn't do on their own. The same is true of Douthy Voidwalker from Modern Horizons. This card is amazing grave hate in general, but it also doubles up with a cool exile effect that again lets us pilfer from our opponents. When you can double up your grave hate with extra synergy with the commander, you know it's an A+, and 60% of players are using it for exactly that reason. Speaking of Modern Horizons, Profane Tutor is also appearing in about 43% of Prosper decks so far. The suspend on this card is a delay that most decks are not really comfortable with, a downside that they're not really willing to bear out, but here for Prosper, it's not that bad. Tutor with an extra treasure token? I mean, why not? Turns out Chandra's not the only Planeswalker that this deck is interested in either. Valky God of Lies and its flip side Tybalt Cosmic Imposter also make an appearance here, because both allow us to play cards from Exile. And in fact, Tybalt Cosmic Imposter does it on such an amazing scale that it's going to be really hard for our opponents to keep up with. Finally, one of the most popular creatures that players are adding to this deck is the card Opposition Agent, which can be a somewhat contentious or annoying card for players, but if we're being honest, we really can't deny how good this ability lines up with Prosper Tomebound. And y'all, those were just the cards that players were adding that have to do with Exile. There's also a whole suite of cards that a whole bunch of players have converged upon to take advantage of the fact that our commander also makes a ton of treasure. Zorn, for instance, didn't come in the precon, but 64% of players are stuffing it into their Prosper deck to help us make two treasures instead of just one so that we can chain tons of spells in a row. Speaking of doubling up treasures, Goldspan Dragon is making it into 42% of decks so far. This is a really expensive card, so it's by no means a necessity for the deck, but it is really interesting to see what this card can do with all the treasures this deck will make. Then we have my two personal favorites. 51% of players are adding in the card Academy Manufacturer to the deck, and 56 are adding in Rebel and Riches. Academy Manufacturer has been so impressive in every single game I've ever seen it, and a commander that creates as many treasures as Prosper will will also get a ton of extra advantage from those clue tokens and food tokens too. And Revel and Riches gives another dimension to all of the treasure tokens we're making, allowing us not just to chain through them by casting tons more spells, but also to save them up for a really intense mini-game win condition. 
Now, win conditions are pretty important for this deck, and so there's a small trend that I'd like to highlight in the data we have so far that I hope to see continue even more. Cards like Reckless Fireweaver, Disciple of the Vault, and Nadir's Nightblade are being added to about a quarter to a third of decks so far, but I really hope that their numbers keep increasing, because these are cards that also help us close things out by weaponizing the treasure tokens that our commander makes for us. Once again, while our commander is a huge value engine, we can't just value our opponents to death, so cards like these are really, really important to help us actually close out the game. Oh, and the final thing I want to throw out here for a very popular card that a lot of players are adding to this deck is Feed the Swarm, because it's one of Rakdos' only ways to get rid of enchantments. In addition to looking through the data for the creatures and spells that players are commonly cutting and adding to the deck, I also like to take a look at what swaps players are making to the precon deck's mana base, in case there are any switches of note. In this case though, it turns out there's not a lot to report. A lot of the lands that we're seeing get added to the mana base are the traditional suite of Rakdos color fixing lands we would expect to see. And of course there's Bajookabog, because, you know, Bajookabog. And while there are a handful of slightly lackluster utility lands from the precon mana base that may not make the cut over time, there's only one land that the majority of players have converged upon as a card to cut from the mana base for sure, and that's the card Zalfiran Void, a colorless scry land. Scry is an ability that synergizes pretty nicely with Prosper's end of turn trigger, but it is also an effect that we can get elsewhere, such as on temples. So it definitely seems like players are highly valuing the color fixing in this case. Honestly, the most important thing to note about this deck is that it came with 39 lands in the precon. And since this deck can plow through so many cards with the exile stuff that we're using and we create tons of mana along the way, that land count can definitely be reduced without risking the health of the deck. Now those are just some of the early swaps that we're seeing in the data so far, but the data doesn't tell the whole story because there are tons of other cool treasures that we can use for this commander. Pun not intended there. What are some other cards that haven't yet shown up popularly in the data that Prosper should definitely take a look at to upgrade the deck even more? Here are some of my ideas. Author of Shadows is secretly a really nasty piece of work, kind of echoing the Douthy Voidwalker that we saw earlier. The Grave Hate is very effective against a whole bunch of different strategies, and this also can give us access to effects that our deck normally wouldn't be able to use on its own. And Cunning Rhetoric from the Strixhaven precons is also a pretty interesting place to look. It doesn't necessarily deter attackers, but this deck takes advantage of that ability in ways that a lot of other decks that are playing Cunning Rhetoric aren't even able to capitalize on. I also want to shout out Deadly Dispute here, which doesn't have a high popularity score yet for this commander, but is so cool. I think this card could get overlooked for this commander, but it totally shouldn't be. It sacrifices one of our treasures, draws us two cards, and replaces the treasure. Draw two for two mana? That's a great rate. I also want to recommend some mana rocks for this deck. Remember, the data showed us that a lot of the mana rocks from the original precon were getting cut, so I think that Liquid Metal Torque and Curse and Mirror should get added to help out with mana. Liquid Metal Torque has really impressed me because turning stuff into an artifact is a really funny thing to do in case someone happens to have artifact removal handy, including ourselves. And Cursed Mirror is just a powerhouse of a card. The duality of abilities is so good that it's totally worth the three mana. In particular, I think it's also important for us to pay attention to mana rocks that don't just help us make red and black mana. Since we have so many cards that can steal things from the top of opponents' libraries, we might end up with a card that has a white activated ability or a blue activation cost and such like that. So in addition to all of our treasure, some mana rocks that help us produce extra colors of mana outside of red and black could also go a pretty long way. Continuing down the line of colorless cards, I think there's Eldrazi that are worth noting here. Oblivion Sower is a lot better than it looks, and it already looks pretty good. We're exiling a lot of cards from graveyards and from the tops of libraries. It's kind of a bummer whenever our stolen strategy flips a land off the top of someone else's deck, but Oblivion Sower completely makes up for that and gives us a huge boost for each one of those lands that we've put into exile. If you're looking for some big value battle cruiser for Prosper, this is totally the way to go. Since we're talking about big cards, I also want to shout out Soulfire Eruption here. Not because I even think it's necessarily the best card that could be added to this deck, but I think it is one of the funniest. For 9 mana, this effect is probably borderline, but since it does have extra synergy with the commander, I think that pushes it over the edge. On the other hand, if you want to shrink way down in scope instead, a card like Sensei's Divining Top, which is admittedly very expensive, is also the type of direction that I could see players upgrading into, because it gives us a greater ability to manipulate the top of our deck for our commander. And Sensei's in particular can put itself back on top of the library, which Prosper can take advantage of if we always know that it will be there. Top deck manipulation could be a very interesting and powerful upgrade to give us a greater degree of control over what we're exiling and playing. And if we want to get a little mean, a card like Karu Mind Eater could also make an appearance in this deck to get cards into exile, but to really punish our opponents while we're doing so. 
And speaking of mean, a potential win condition that I'd love to see thrown into this deck is Jury Master of the Review. We're sacrificing a lot of permanence this way, so Jury will build up and up and up for a huge bout of damage. We can also look into keywords that allow us to play more cards from Exile too. For example, adventure creatures like Murderous Rider allow us to play the spell from hand and the creature later on from Exile. Cascade, Rebound, Suspend effects also will let us play things from Exile in kind of fun sneaky ways. And extra foretell cards like Poison the Cup can also be a cool direction to look. I do think it's important to note that playing stuff from Exile still just nets us one treasure from the commander, so it isn't the ultimate goal of the deck, because we do want to make sure that we're actually getting the value from the card first and foremost, but these are definitely interesting directions to pursue. And no lie, I think it's also probably worthwhile for this deck to consider moving into snow-covered lands for the sake of Draugr Necromancer, which can hate a bit on enemy graveyards and also allows us to play cards from Exile as long as we've got the snow mana to do it. This is a sincerely cool card to add to the deck, but it does require a snow mana base. And on the subject of frozen cards, I have to shout out what I think might be my favorite card to put into this deck that we haven't yet seen pop up in the data, and that's the card Ice Cauldron. This thing's wordy as heck and confusing as heck, but bear with me. It basically doubles as a Dream Devourer. We can tap it to put a card into exile, and we can cast that card as long as it remains exiled. And the rest of the text on this card involves saving up mana to put into that card when we cast it later. But we don't even really need that. This is just a way to allow us to play cards from our hand from exile instead. It's weird and wordy, and there's some timing restrictions that are attached to it, but if you're willing to go through the novel length text on this card, it's pretty funny tech. And I've also totally gotta shout out the hilarity that is Uba Mask, which forces everyone to play from exile. This effect is symmetrical, but we will take advantage of it best. So those are the most popular changes that we're seeing players have made to the pre-constructed planar portal deck so far, but what do you think? Are there any cards that players have kept in the deck that might be worth taking out? Any cards that they have taken out that you think players should definitely put back into the deck? Any cards that players have added that don't need to be there? Or any cards that aren't yet showing up in the data that you totally think should be played in a Prosper Tonebound deck? We'd love to hear from you, so leave your comments below, and we'll see you on the next Precon Recon. Recon.